Let me introduce our second speaker. Zara is an art critic specialised in South Asian contemporary art. Widely published, she's a regular contributor to Art Forum and the London correspondent for Art India. You may have seen her review of Tate Britain's Shemser exhibition in the March edition of Art Forum. Just completing her PhD at the Courtauld um, on contemporary Indian art and nationalism, her book, The Empire Strikes Back, Indian Art Today, was published by Random House in London in 2010. Thank you. Hello. Sorry. <laughs> Isn't it nice to know we're just two papers away from a drink? <laughs> okay. So it's a bit of a jokey paper and definitely not meant to be taken very seriously, though you're quite welcome to fight with it. So this is just to say, um, the 31st of May in 2016 was a very big day for the Indian art world. At 6.30 p.m., Tate Modern opened its doors to mass throngs, many of whom had flown in specially for the privilege of attending the opening party of the open kakar you can't please all. Almost more excitement, of a negative variety admittedly, had been caused earlier that day when the Guardian's art critic, Jonathan Jones, stirred the pot with one of his reviews. Jones said of the kakar show at Tate Modern, in case anyone missed it, I doubt it, <laughs> but <laughs> you never know. <laughs> <laughs> On the evidence of his latest Bankside exhibition, to be a truly modern painter is to be a ham-fisted hack. These paintings belong in the Royal Academy summer show, not Tate Britain. Only very rarely, for instance, in a funny caricature of a lonely Englishman in a pub, we'll come back to this character, does Kaka raise a smile. There he is. Man in pub. In her review of Jonathan Jones's review, Geeta Kapoor hit where it hurt. She said, <laughs> he still writes like a provincial Englishman. <laughs> Using discarded art historical categories, he repeats well-enshrined modernist criterion and yet claims partisanship with advanced art that should, he says, be the remit of Tate Modern. Jones heaps scorn on Kakar for being a painter without pedigree, pedigree being a trait still cherished by the English when their own identity holds little conviction. Okay. More openly nostalgic for a vanished Indianness was Amit Chowdhury's review in The Guardian that followed on he Jonathan Jones's heels a few days later. Deliberately ignoring Jones, Chowdhury reminds us that Kakar's eye for kit needs to be placed within the tastes of 20th century Gujarat of the 20th century Gujarati Hindu community. Think of the Patels who, after being expelled from Uganda in the 1970s, transformed Britain. Okay. His imagination comes alive at the very moment when the ba bizarre dimension of bourgeois culture is both part of Indian modernity and is an embarrassment to it. It still isn't an element in the cultural progression leading to the BJP. The figure in Indian art must count among the richest and most unexpected inheritances of secular modernity, and Kakar is greatest pioneer. Okay. Now, Chaudhary's accolade is far from naive. It upholds Kakar as an icon of Indian modernism, his figuration indebted to Hindu devotional practices, strategically reminding us that the spiritual father of Indian nationalism, Gandhi, uh, was like Kakar, Gujarati. Um, Chowdhury also notes Kakar's figurative contribution to secularism, in contrast to the BJP's chauvinistic exclusion of minorities. So, there we have it. See the Muslim in the background? There we <laughs> Politics and prides are carefully mixed in Chowdhury's cocktail, which vindicates Kakar's inclusion in the Tate. Like the Patels of Uganda, his presence adds much to Britain, we are told. So all three reviews demonstrate something vital. While the British reviewer, c reviewer condemns Bhupin, the artist, Indian reviewers are busy defending his oeuvre in terms of what he contributed to Indian modernism, secularism, culture. On both sides of the great divide, then, it isn't the show that is being judged, but Kakar's relative importance for national narratives. Who discussed the curatorial agenda of the exhibition itself? Did it do a good job in its choices? Did it hold together conceptually? The silence is deafening. 
But isn't this a mission revealing? It shows us that the battle between these competing perspectives takes place on the same unacknowledged ground. It is not about the quality of the exhibition, but whether or not Bopin deserves a British retrospective that is under discussion. And if he does, where and on what basis? Does he belong at Tate Modern, a bastion of modernism? Well, supposedly. Should he have been stuffed into Tate Britain, a reminder of the old ways? On both sides of the debate, Kaka has morphed into a symbol of the arrival of Indian art on London's supposedly global stage. It is the nature of the Tate's inclusivity that I would like to address very quickly now. So two mega exhibitions at the, ta at the Tate's have recently embraced Indian art. Before Tate Modern's prophetically titled You Can't Please All, we witnessed Tate Britain's artist and empire. Predictably, for those who see Jones as the increasingly conservative voice of old Britain, Jones reveled in this extravaganza. <laughs> he said, it is the genius of Tate Britain's exhibition to resurrect the British Empire as a physical reality you can touch and feel, the ghosts of empire become flesh and blood in this awe-inspiring, exciting and provocative exhibition. <laughs> Wow, okay. <laughs> In contrast, we've already heard what he had to say about the Boop and Kaka. So this is how our critique could go. We could say, Jones is the symbol of exclusion. Of course he would think that Boop and Kaka belongs at the Royal Academy. This is because he is mean-spirited and denies that other countries, especially Britain's one-time colony, deserve a place in the modernist canon. No wonder he came, compared Wopenkaka to Beryl Cook, whose paintings of overweight housewives and chunky nudes are laughed at rather than lauded. And no wonder he loved artists and empire, which sidelined modern Indian art. By sort of there. But if we take this line of attack and stop at it, we miss something that both Tate's attempt to please share. Let's look. In Artist and Empire, modern art from the Commonwealth, inverted commas, was crammed in higgledy-piggledy higgledy towards the end of the display, as if it were hurriedly, uh, as if it was a hurried afterthought. Jamini Roy's Kaligat inspired motifs, Aubrey Williams' tribal mark II, Avinash Chandra's Hills of Gold, here it is, uh, battled with a wall dedicated to the Jamta Caves and Forest Walk by Balraj Khanna. The wall text of this section, which was called Out of Empire, informed us. In 1965, Avinash Chandra's Hills of Gold became the first modernist work by an Indian artist to en enter the national collection at the Tate Gallery. However, in the years following the breakup of empire, many black and British artists found their work judged according to preconceived notions of authenticity and difference. A growing sense of marginalization led to the landmark exhibition The Other Story at the Hayward Gallery in 1989, of which we've heard quite a lot. So, Basically, this line runs like this. The wall text implies that this is no longer the case, since the self-same artists that resorted to the Hayward story are now jammed happily onto the walls of the Tate instead. Moral, the Tate has returned to its progressive modern self. The belated in inclusion of these modern works in the second last room, notwithstanding, in a similarly expansive mode, Kakar's extravaganza Tate Modern informs us at the very door that it is the first international retrospective of the work by the Indian artist since his death in 2003, bringing together work from across five decades. What an achievement, we think, for the Tate to hold the first international survey of such an important modern Indian artist. And what a lovely coincidence that he happened to spend time in Britain, be inspired by British pop, David Hockney's nude med, and the aforementioned British institution, very important, the pub. So now let's be truthful. Both shows function as an advert for Br British identity mongering. How inclusive should Britain be? Does Britishness gain from strategically inserting other voices into its swan songs? Does international modernism, which of course both Tates would like to be spokespersons for, gain by embracing other artists in, the new, in its new and improved dialogue? To these questions, the Tates have answered in the affirmative, admittedly with more or less enthusiasm. Yes, says Tate Modern, conditionally, says Tate Britain. State Britain, on the other hand, as last week's referendum shows, has voted no. Yet the terms of the, the, terms of the discussion remain navel-gazingly fixated. So my question is this. 
By harping on Indian artists' right to be included in Britain's various self-aggrandizing canons, should we not also ask what Indian artists have to gain or lose by, from various types of airings? This isn't to diminish the Tate's achievement or to say that we shouldn't celebrate Bhopin's long-awaited visit to Tate Modern. It is just to put it in perspective. In our fear that we might be excluded from the party that is modern British art, maybe we should also ask if there are other bashes happening elsewhere. <laughs>